a minute early. Oop, right on time. Man, this will be like the one lecture that's on time. <coughs> well, welcome back to those of you that made it there and back again. Um, what's going on this week? Oh, yeah, tower testing Friday, right? Big excitement. It's at the event of the semester. We should uh, invite guests. We had, we had guest critics one year that came and gave aesthetic uh, points. Just and, some huh? Just some towers. Are there? We should do that. We should get some um, guest jurors to come and we'll look nice. into that. <laughs> okay, well, we um, ran through steel last time, which uh, we talked about columns, right? Beams, right? Notice beams, oh, these are beams, look different from columns. You can spot them a mile away. Uh, there's a guy making a steel building. Look at that. All right. Oh, and this chart, you know, man. That was one of the things I wanted to do over break, was make that chart. And you know, I didn't get it done. Shoot. Well, maybe, maybe I can work on that this week. That would, be, that would be a real achievement for the year if I could do that. Uh, this, one's in the, this one's in the book, which is the next best thing to the, the other one. Uh, this one you should definitely know how to use. I guess you did you. You've already done the steel problem, right? Oh yeah, so this is, this is completely known to you. You don't need to talk about this. Good, okay. There's a steel beam. There's a, with the section modulus. Okay. Mm, design, yeah, we know how to do this. Did we talk about this? This problem, was this in the, the um, shear design? Was, was that in the, the online problem? Because I think in the book he kind of skips by that somehow. I don't know why he does that, but, but this would be the moment to take 30 seconds and say a little bit more about steel. Uh, when we did, when we did uh, wood beams, we were very careful to do a shear analysis. I mean, you, do, you design it or you analyze it first for m flexure, for moment, uh, for bending. Uh, but then you, you always check it in shear because sometimes well, wood's a little bit weaker in, in shear, and it can split and, and fail. Steel less often has a problem. It's usually OK in shear, but you should, it would still be another mode of failure that you could check. And the check is fairly simple. The, the allowable stress, is that what I'm doing here? I hope I see this somewhere. Oh, there it is. <laughs> the allowable stress is uh, uh, 0.4 times, this is the yield stress. In this example that we were running through, this was the yield stress, 50 KSI steel. So the allowable is simply uh, 0.4 times 50. So this would be the allowable shear stress. The, the, um, this is the shear force, which would be the end reaction probably. Um, is the maximum in a simple span will always be the maximum shears over at the end reaction. The formula for, this is the actual, supposed to be the actual shear stress is a little bit different. Uh, you remember that famous formula, VQ over IB, right? Doesn't that sound, it's almost like, it's not quite as famous as MC over I, but VQ over IB is really up there in the list of of formulas, right? <laughs> Make sure I'm saying the right one. VQ over IB, right. Uh, but this is not quite VQ over IB. This is really more of P over A. Um, and what's going on is they simplify it slightly for um, steel. Because of the shape, you know, if you remember, we did this last semester for a simple rectangular shape. If if you calculate the shear, this is the, the horizontal shear at different heights. Here's the, here's the neutral axis, okay? And if you calculate the, the shear, you could, you could make a plot of the shear distribution. The shear way out at the, at the ex extreme fibers where the moment is the most, the shear is zero. And, 
and as you go down, the shear increases, and you get kind of a nice parabolic uh, distribution. So, hmm, if you had a if you had a beam, a rectangular section, it would be most likely to split a, a, a wooden beam would be most likely to split in shear right at the neutral axis in the center, because there's where you have the most uh, force that's opposing in this direction. All the top in in compression going one way and the bottom in tension going the other way and right at the middle where it meets you have the greatest uh, difference and the it'll have the greatest shear horizontal shear um, in in a steel beam because you've got the the flanges right we talked about this too I think years ago the areas change. Here you've got a constant area, and this, um, this stress, if you imagine it, there's, a, there's an area here, and there's a, there's a stress going on on that area. Here the area suddenly changes. The, the, the force is, is um, pretty low to begin with, but then there's a, there's a a sudden drop in in the area. So the area is very wide up here and then it gets very small. So you get, as a result, you get a, a sudden jump when the area goes down, the stress suddenly goes up. So you get a, a, a jump in the, in the stress and then the rest of the, the parabolic curve is out there. And because of this, because of this jump, it's the same parabolic curve, but it tends to in proportion to this jump, it tends to look fairly flat. And if you took, if you took an average of, of this, um, that would be kind of an average of, from the, here's the peak stress, and here back here, so this is kind of an average. This average is like the average stress over, over this whole thing, which would be a P over A kind of stress, and this is the, um, TW, and this is, actually D is all the way out to there. So if you look at it, if you're looking at this rank rectangle here, then, then the area of that is TWD. That's the, the TWD there. And the, the V is the, the shear force, the, average, the, the force at that section. So what you, you end up with as this kind of average stress is the, the V over uh, T TWD. It's not, it, it's a little bit less than, this, this would be maximum, right? This would be the, the max. And this is, what you're actually doing is getting a, we'll say an average. So it's a little bit less, but it's not, as it turns out, it's not a lot less. And it's an awful lot easier to calculate. And, and it's usually less by, you know, the same amount. It's like always 10% under or something or close to it uh, or 20% under. So, so what they do is they make this, what's done is this value's increased or, or decreased rather. I mean, rather than Say for flexure, you had 0.6 up there. Here it's dropped to 0.4. And, and you just take, a, you take an average value here that you know is a little bit low, but you make up for it in that, in that low number there. Does that make sense? Maybe. Anyway, uh, it's the way it's done. And it's a, this formula is, this, this formula right here, if you actually got the max, that's the one that's equal to VQ over IB. But if you, you know, to try to get this VQ over, the reason that this is so much more attractive, to get this Q, you, it's, not a, it's not a simple rectangle like this. For wood sections, this, this number, if you remember, came out to be something fairly simple. What is it? Mm. 3 halves V over A because it, it, it reduces down um, 
because there's a constant D cross-section in the areas in terms of D and B, and, or constant B cross-section. So, so it, it, it reduces to that fairly easy formula. This one doesn't reduce uh, very conveniently because you have an irregular shape. And you have to remember these are all, every profile's a different shape. So you'd have to start, you'd have to add another quantity to tables to calculate that. It's just really messy. So this is a, this is a for expediency, that's taken. That V over TWD, it's slightly less. And it's made up for in the, the allowable. And you can see it's probably not too likely to control. I mean, here in this case, uh, the shear force was 20. And the amount of area in, the, in this web is far in excess of what you need. You only come out with the, the average stress would be 4.09. And 20 is allowable. So you're like five times under, right? I mean, it's got a enormous leeway there. So you can see it's hardly worth diddling about some little amount. It's not, it doesn't normally matter. And for that reason, steel is simplified a little bit like that. Hmm. OK, so now you know how to do shear. If you ever wanted to do that. If, if it did fail in shear, oh, I could add this too. I should put this slide in. I think later in the semester, we, or was it last semester we talked about shear? Yeah, maybe I showed the slide last semester. It's a nice bridge. As you go into Detroit that has the very visible on bridges, you can see the uh, shear reinforcing. If a, if a beam needs, sometimes they do actually need a little uh, extra stiffening uh, for shear. And what, what the solution is, rather than get a bigger beam, it really only needs the stiffening in probably a uh, uh, limited region. Is just put s uh, stiffening plates in there. And you see these vertical plates welded into beams uh, right very often toward the reaction. Uh, if, it's a, if it's a beam that has a, a heavy load on it and a fairly short span, you may see the, and that's the way these bridges are. They're big railway bridges across the uh, interstate 90 or something, one of those interstates as you go into Detroit, uh, 96. Uh, you see a lot of these uh, stiffening plates welded on uh, to, the, to the, um, the web there. And that prevents two things. The web could, could uh, buckle this way in, in shear. The, the plate could actually deform like a, oops, like a sheet of you know, paper. It could be doing this, and those plates plates welded in there would stiffen it. It could also crumple, uh, cr cripple uh, like that, and the plates would stiffen it against that. So those little plates you see are for that reason. Uh, and the last thing you might want to calculate would be uh, deflection, which is fairly uh, simple calculation with steel. Uh, this is uh, the formula that you could find almost anywhere in the back of the book, for example, uh, for a distributed load. Uh, that's what we were, we were looking at here, wasn't it? Yeah, this distributed load with uh, 1.25 uh, kips per foot. So there you've got distributed load. There's 1.25 kips per foot. There's the span. This is in feet. This is in inches, KSI. Everything's in inches except that span. So this is all inches, KSI. This is inches. So this is a conversion to get this span from um, feet to inches. And that, um, if you can remember it, whenever you do a deflection calculation, that's always the same conversion. If, this, if the span's in feet, everything else is in inches, and that's the same conversion. And then these are the limits. Uh, that might come from a, this is a little s table out of the, the uh, building code, Michigan code. Almost all the codes have these exact same numbers. Uh, this would be, you know, for different situations for either live load alone or live, total live and dead load combined, you have different deflection limits. And the limits are in terms of the span. I'd say the span, uh, if the span were, um, 
be an easy one to do in my head. Uh, 12, 12 feet. No, that's not a good one. 10 feet. Ah, 10 feet. Okay, 10 feet <laughs> times uh, 12 inches would be 120 inches, right? 120 inches then would be the L divided by, oh, there's an easy one. If I was doing this, you know, any one of these, here it would be uh, less than an inch, right? Here 120 uh, divided by 120 would be exactly an inch. Here it would be a little bit uh, less than an inch, right? In each of, each of those cases, you'd get a, a number, and the in, number would be in inches then if you put the, put the L in in inches. And then that inch limit is um, how much deflection you can reasonably tolerate. So here, if we say over L over 240, 32 feet times 12 over uh, 240 would be uh, 1.6 inches. And here we had 1.9. So it would fail that criteria, actually, right? This is, this is one that's more lenient. This would be a roof, probably a roof with nothing going on. Uh, exterior and interior walls and what's this? Flexible finishes, farm buildings. Okay, this is the type of construction. All right, farm buildings and greenhouses. Oh no, that's this. All right, it's this one. Flexible finishes, exterior and interior walls and partitions with flexible finishes. Okay, partitions. Okay, well, I thought it had something more to do with roofs, but. If that's that case, then you'd pass it as long as it, if it's a beam, I suppose, supporting uh, a wall or supporting something that's not going to be damaged by, it's flexible, wouldn't be damaged by uh, the deflections, then you could use that limit. Oop. Okay, well, the other thing we got to talk about in this chapter is uh, composite construction. This is where you combine uh, a steel beam with a concrete slab and actually tie them together. Uh, if you just have, a, if you just have a, a slab and you set it on top of any old beam, well, then that's, that's not really what's, talked of, what's meant by composite construction. That's just a, a slab resting on a steel beam, and the steel beam would support it, and, and you design the steel beam exactly as we just, just did. You'd calculate the load on this. Um, this would probably be a simple span across here. It would be resting on the beam, and the beam would have to support the entire slab. Another way to approach it, way to do it, is you could tie these two together so, so that it acts not, not just as, as this member resting on, on this member, but the two of them tied together so that if I if I bind them together and I tie them together with these little, this is a, a shear stud, would be welded on, welded on to the beam here ahead of time, and then you, then you cast the concrete uh, onto these steel studs so that these are embedded in the slab. That way it ties the two, the, t the two are mechanically keyed together, and, and they act then as a, as a, as a composite beam that the, you have the steel underneath and you have the, the concrete uh, buttoned onto the top of it, essentially, uh, and the two act as one. The concrete hopefully is up in the top where it's in compression. Um, if you did it like this, you'd probably, probably not get too much use out of it because, I mean, if this, this were the orientation, if the, if the concrete cracked, except for maybe steel that might be in it, it wouldn't do any good, right? It's the it's the compression the it, it being up in the compression area that that works, and and that's the way beams go anyway. So, <laughs> so it works out well. Uh, these are some pictures that uh, who got these? Uh, Ryan or a friend of Ryan's maybe. These are from over at our uh, Michigan Stadium, I think, uh, of uh, some that were being done. You can see this is a. This is a regular uh, corrugated steel deck. Underneath this is the steel beam running, and these are welded right through the right through the uh, the decking. If it's a heavy decking, they they have to pre-drill it, and then weld weld on there. But if it's a light gauge decking, these things are uh, they they go in a machine that's like a it's a giant spot welder, and they get put in. There's a little flux cap on it 
and it just immediately arc welds through the decking and everything, and there it is. <laughs> you can pass it around. Make sure I get it back. <laughs> I don't have too many left. I think I lost one last time. Um, and then once this is cast over, these are tied, of course, tied into the slab and, and the whole thing acts together. Okay, there's a limit to how much of the slab you can uh, count as being in the compression zone. For, in, for instance, if I had to have a, um, a steel beam like this, and you can imagine, say this, were, this slab was just enormously wide. There's just one lonely beam out there in the center and this huge concrete slab. Well, it, it's not going to all tie back into the, the, uh, the beam. It doesn't all affect the beam. There's a, uh, a limited distance that really participates in the action, in the beam action of the, uh, the steel section here. And, and that distance depends on the thickness of the slab. It also depends on the, the, the span in this direction. It's kind of a proportional thing. It also depends on, on um, the spacing. I mean, if you had, uh, say, you had these beams um, several spaced together, you couldn't, it, it would make no sense to say, OK, here's, here's a beam here. I'll count this much of the slab acting with this beam, and then this much of the slab acting with this beam. So you'd be overlapping. When you did the calculation, you'd be counting concrete twice as, as if it were double dutying. It couldn't really do that, right? So, so, there, so there's some practical limits uh, as to how much of this you count. And that's sort of what's, this is a little bit difficult to, to describe. But these, um, OK, this, this set of criteria goes with, with the uh, scenario here where you have slab on both sides. You might look at this one as typical. This, this set of criteria uh, describes this situation. What's, what's meant by a quarter of the span, this is, they're all dimensioning <coughs> the, the effective flange width here. That's why the dimension arrows are showing it like that. The quarter span is in the other direction, though. It's a quarter of that span, not a quarter of this span. So that's the, the one criteria would be uh, you, you figure out what this span is. One quarter of that is then this dimension. That's, the, that's one criteria. The next criteria, <coughs> this, this overhang distance can't be any more than half, the, half of the uh, clear span. So in other words, the to the on center point there. You can't exceed, you can't come over here because you're interfering with this one. So it's from center to center. So it would be this plus that plus the same thing on the other side. So that's another criteria. The on center spacing is what this one is, on center. This, this spacing is exactly the same as this spacing, right? So that's it. That's, that's what's that is describing. This one, eight, eight times the slab depth, is another, uh, would go from like here to here. <coughs> and it's just based on the, the, the thickness of the slab. Eight times the slab thickness is this overhang. So then you have to put that on both sides and add the, add the flange in there. So it, what is also a little confusing is of these, these criteria, they're not all describing the same distance, as, as this, this illustration nicely shows. The first one gives you the distance you really want. These you kind of have to convert. You have to say this times 2 plus that to get the, the effect of flange. In the end, in the end, what you want is, is the amount of, you know, is, is what this kind of shows, the amount of the flange that's participating. And then uh, for the other side, you know, it's a, the same thing again, except uh, these, you only have one side. But you'd have this plus, you, you plus this again. This is a different span criteria. And it's only going from you know, the, the side like that. <clears throat> you look at, the th in each case, the three criteria. 
and then you have to take the, the uh, least of the three. So you have three different, three different parameters you check, and you take the least of, the, of, the, of those three, you take the, the lesser. All right, not too difficult. To, to run through the analysis, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, it's very similar to what we did before a, a couple of chapters ago with the composite sections. Um, the first thing you do is you're going to do it with a transform section. So you have to define this. Uh, well, OK, step one is figure out how much of the flange is actually in the picture. So you have to get <laughs> define how much uh, of that concrete is actually acting. Then, then calculate a, a, a modal um, constant, this n. And in this case, it's, it's much more convenient to transform the, the concrete. You know, before, when we, when we did the um, uh, composite materials, we always transformed the stronger material, right? We had like, we had wood, for example, with a steel plate in it. And we transformed the steel, right, if I remember right. The steel got real thick. Or you had, you had a, a plate, a, set of steel, a, a wood beam this way, and you had steel or something, metal on the top and bottom. And then those, we transformed the metal, and it got real wide. Well, in this, <clears throat> it's much more convenient to do it the other way around, to transform the concrete. And the reason is, if you transform the, if you transform the steel, you'd be transforming this funny shape. If you transform the concrete, it's just a rectangle. So it's much easier to scale this simple rectangle than to try to mess around with scaling uh, this, this shape here and then worry about all the little intricacies or what shape it actually is. So, so what's done is the base material is always steel. So that's why the steel goes on the bottom. So you know the steel doesn't change. And the scaled material is the concrete. So this number, <clears throat> this number will always come out less than one. The concrete's always going to shrink. It's going, you're going to be converting the concrete into an equivalent amount of steel, whereas before you converted the steel into equivalent amount of wood or something, right? The steel got real huge. Well, now, now you're going to convert the concrete into equivalent amount of steel. So what happens is this what might be a fairly long uh, flange here, whatever, you know, this, this goes on. You determine immediately this, how much of it is uh, effective, right? This becomes the, the effective length. And then this, this gets scaled, and that's, that, that flange gets smaller. Okay, once you've done that, then you calculate a transform section. Or yeah, you with that scaled concrete, you'd you'd make a transform section so that this would then scale down. You know, maybe the concrete gets like that, and this is, whoops. <laughs> All right, you have the picture. Something like that. All right, this would be the transform section. And this is, this is the N scaled area, right? AN. And then you calculate, a, you calculate a transform moment of inertia, same as we did. The only thing you have to be careful about is uh, that we didn't have to worry about before with the other so if we were looking at like wood and steel, both wood and steel can act in either tension or compression, right? But concrete only acts effectively in, in com compression. So if you have, when you do this, if you have a neutral axis down here somewhere, then that's no problem. Then, then this is all in, in compression, this is in tension, and you can ca immediately calculate your, your um, whatever, new um, moment of inertia. 
if you, the proportions might be a little bit different, though, you might have a situation that looked more like this, I mean, as an extreme, and you'd calculate the, the neutral axis up here, then this, this doesn't count. This is going to be in tension. This is in compression. So you'd have this acting and this not acting, and then this acting again, right? Mm. <laughs> Well, I'll try and do one here that includes that at the end. But that would be the difference in the, um, might make a difference in the, how you calculated this transform section. You just don't include any, any concrete that's in tension. Then once you get that, once you have that, you can plug it into these equations, right? You can either, depending what you want to do, if you want to find the stress, and you say you know the moment, this would be in a, uh, analyzing the stress, I suppose. Uh, plug these in. This is for the, the concrete case, right? Here it's scaled for the concrete. It's concrete scaled. And this would be, uh, and these C's different. This would be like to the, down to this point here. And the other one would be up for the concrete would be up to the uh, extreme fibers. And you could find the, the stress in the, either in the steel or the concrete, or you can, or you can put in the allowable values and calculate the, the, uh, the allowable loads. So you can do it you know, in, in either direction. In either case, you'd have to, uh, like in, in this case, uh, you'd get two different moments, and then you'd choose the, the smaller moment, because only the same as when we did the other composites, that was a technique you find which fails first, basically. Because you don't know if, when you're working this equation, you don't know if the steel fails or the concrete fails first. So you work both, both equations and then just take the lower moment would be the one that would occur first with those allowables. OK. So here's an example we can go through pretty quickly. This was one out of the textbook, I think. Um, and, and this one is run through it uh, with two different scenarios. The first, uh, assuming that it's just a, a steel beam underneath a, a slab, not connected. And then, then we'll look at the difference it makes to, to have it as a composite, to where they're both connected. Um, all right, I think that's the way this has worked. These are the, this is, the allowable value for the uh, s steel, or yeah, steel and the concrete. Um, the effect of flange width, flange width, will will already take. It comes out to a bit, essentially 90 if you run through those equations. He tends to round these a little bit. I think it's actually a little bit like an inch or two bigger, maybe, but we can take that. Uh, the modular ratio, well, let's see, working at first, this, this, this takes the, uh, calculates the, the dead load of the, the slab here. Here's the tributary area, right, 13 by 60. That, that area would be the tributary area, the load uh, on this beam. Um, and the, the weight of the slab would be at 150 pounds per cubic foot, 5 inches thick, so 5 twelfths, so 150. There's a, a 62 PSF. That times the width would be what's on one linear foot, so that dead load is 812 PLF. The, mm, let's see, why is it, where'd the live load come from? Oh, I think that's what we're finding. We're going to calculate what the live load would be, the capacity of this beam. So that's a pretty deep second. This isn't really drawn to scale at all. You should re redo it, really. This is 36 inches deep, right? So that's a, that's a deep say. It's all probably closer to this. That's, this is only five. This is six times, so it should be six times deeper than that slab. So it's one, two, closer to what I drew here, something like that. Anyway, uh, looking at the capacity of just the, just the steel section first. You'd look up the section modulus, right? 
we've, we've got this as the allowable uh, stress, which is, is, uh, happens to be 0.66 Fy, is 24 KSI. So we can immediately take, find the moment. This is then the allowable moment capacity is just Fs, 24 times the section modulus. That gives me that in kip inches, <coughs> 10,500 kip inches, which in kip feet would be that. Okay, that's, that's the total. That's the total capacity of that steel beam. Now, if you want to find what the live load is, you just need to kind of back calculate from that. Uh, if the total is this, actually, is the dead load plus the live load, we already know that, well, we can easily calculate the dead load because that's, that's what we had there a second before. <coughs> Here's the dead load moment, then. This is the uh, distributed load times the span is 60 squared. That gives you that dead load moment. Subtract the dead load moment from the total, and that'll leave you with the live load. That'll be this amount, 451. Then you equate that uh, moment to this, um, the distributed moment equation, and then you can calculate what this, this uh, W load is. This is in pounds per foot, right? Or, so that's like, or kips per foot, rather. Uh, one kip per linear foot. And then if you want back, calculate again further <laughs> to figure out what the PSF is. So you found, you found, mm, I can do it like this. We just found what it is, one linear foot, okay? What one linear foot of this beam. Now I can spread it back out over the floor. Uh, by dividing it by 13, and that gives me the PSF load on the floor. So that's 77, 77 PSF. So that beam, <clears throat> taking the, you know, the slab is just a, a slab resting on it, not attached to it. Uh, just the strength of the beam alone could carry uh, that much load on the, on the slab, 77 PSF live load. So that just gives you a gauge, 77. Okay. Now, to compare that to what we would expect if I, if I <coughs> button these two things together, fasten them together with the, the shear stud, it should get stronger, right? It's got to get stronger. So instead of 77, we'd hope, oh, maybe 100, maybe more than 100. So the, the idea of this is to see how much, how much you actually gain. Nope, is that the next slide? Yeah, I guess so. Okay, so assuming they're, they're together, then you have to, have to build this uh, transform section. Here, it, it was actually, uh, the effective width was 90 inches, right? This picture, the effective was 90. The, end, the modular ratio is 1 ninth. It must be up here somewhere. Oh, there it is. Uh, EC over ES is one ninth. So one ninth times times this ninety gives me ten inches. So when I scale it, the scaled concrete is only ten inches wide. So if I converted that ninety inches of concrete down into steel, I'd have ten a ten inch wide piece of steel. That's still quite a chunk of steel. So you can conceptually kind of see it <coughs> from from the little beam it was. I mean it's thirty six. That, that top flange normally is only, uh, yeah, it'd be interesting to look it up. I don't have my book with me, though. <laughs> well, you can look it up. It's probably like an uh, inch or something at most, that top flange. And now you're, you're making it 10 inches thick so that it's getting definitely stronger, right? It's going from, from a little, um, well, it's getting like that. I mean, it's, getting, oh, it's five inches thick. I'm sorry. What am I saying? It's five inches thick. You're making it 10 inches wide. So it's quite a, you have to imagine that as an additional steel being put up there. It's definitely going to get quite a bit stronger. <clears throat> okay. So we want to find the neutral axis here. First, you've got to find, it, it, to, to, you, what you really want, all you really want is, you don't want that number. What do you want? You want this. You want that. Okay. But to get that, to get the, the moment of inertia, you've got to first get the neutral axis. 
Then once you have the neutral axis, then you can calculate the, the um, uh, moment of inertia. Uh, so this is kind of a weird shape. You could do it by uh, you know, rectangle here on top. Um, this section already has properties. Um, it is symmetric, at least. You know where the center of uh, gravity. If we take, what do we take here? The top is the base, sort of upside down. We're going to take the top as the baseline. So I'm going to get this neutral axis measured from the top down. Okay, then we got A, X, A, X, and they go into this formula. Remember doing this? And you just add up the, add up the values. The X's would be like from the center here. I'm going to the top. Okay, that's a little bit easier, I guess, because, I don't know, it's a rectangle at the top. So that's, this was five, so that, that's two and a half. Now I've got to go from the center here. I'd have to look up the, the depth of this. It's probably like 20, well, let's see, that was a 36. What would that be? Eight, 18 something inches, probably, is half of that, half of that depth plus the five inches up here. So I'm going from, from this to the base, right? That's my, my x there, and apparently 22.7. <clears throat> and you multiply those together, add that up, and you get 11.47. So this distance here, then there's the neutral axis. Then you can draw it on there and see where it comes. It should be, I mean, it, it can't be below the center of this. That would make no sense, right? It's got to be somewhere up above. The thicker this is, the further up it goes, right? The more, the more mass you have up here, it's going to pull it. Because remember, this is the balance point. It's just the, where the thing's balancing. And that's why I say this is a little bit deceptive. This isn't the scale. This thing's 36 inches deep. So really, it's, it's down here somewhere. And that is the, is the, the balance point. <clears throat> OK, so given this uh, location for the, the neutral axis, then you can go ahead and calculate. Uh, this is using the. the uh, parallel axis theorem, uh, this formula, you can calculate the, the uh, transform moment of inertia. So this is BD cubed over 12, right? This one you've got, this is, comes out of a table. Uh, the distance, now you've got to figure from that down to there uh, somewhere. I guess that's like maybe this distance minus two and a half. Okay. Oh, yeah, look, that's why, that's why somebody did it. <clears throat> to get that, and then this is, you've got to calculate that little distance, and you multiply all that through, and you get, that is the moment of inertia then. Pretty high. Woo, it's busy. Went from alone, 7,800, combined with the uh, slab up here, 17,000. So from 7,000 to 17,000, right? So it does, you can see it's getting a lot stiffer quite a bit, more than double the stiffness. <clears throat> so now when you put it back into these equations, this is for the concrete. You have to, have to uh, solve each of these separately. This is the, uh, the concrete equation. So this is the, the allowable stress for the concrete. This moment of inertia will stay the same. Here's the distance from the neutral axis up to, oops, oops, up, come back, come back. It's from the neutral axis up. The other one's going to be from the neutral axis down. So there's the 11 and the 29. That's this 11 there. And then for the steel, it, it's the uh, right there. The C is 29. So those numbers change. This stays the same, and the steel value changes. You work both of them, and you see which one's lower. This one's 18. This one's 14. So this one controlled. That means the steel, <coughs> in this scenario, the, the steel and what it is, the steel is so deep, the steel down here at the bottom is going to start to stretch, is going to yield <clears throat> before that concrete up on the, up on the uh, slab uh, would fail in compression, which is, is basically what you want. You don't want the concrete failing first, generally. You want the steel to yield. So that's what happened. And that gives you a stress, allowable stress. You know, if you back calculate it in the concrete, that's not really necessary. But uh, that's the stress in the concrete, right? Calculate the stress. Given that moment, this moment, put it into the concrete equation, you could get the stress in the concrete. 
which is, of course, lower than, than what that was. <coughs> OK, now to finish it off, we wanted to know what the live load. That gave us a moment, right? Or no, that gave us a stress. Hmm, where's my moment? No, I didn't mean give me a stress. I didn't give me a moment. There, gave me this moment. OK, so this is the moment capacity now. OK, I can calculate the subtract off again from that moment capacity, subtract off the dead load. Um, and I'm given a live load. That's the live load. And then again, just like before, I back calculate the live load, find it in PLF first, and then divide it by 13 and get PSF. So now I've got 127 before I had 77, if I remember. So it went from 77 up to um, 127. Didn't quite double, but, but quite an quite a increase in strength for it. Now, the one thing I might show you quickly, I'll change one thing here just to make you aware that what um, can happen in another scenario. Without reworking the whole problem, I just wanted to give you a, um, try to do some numbers for another one. This one, when we worked it, uh, was probably kind of like this. This was the uh, W36 by, what does it say, 135? If you picked a much smaller section, and I tried one um, that I knew would be a lot smaller, a W10 by 19, say, then you do get it, then you do get a different situation. <coughs> Uh, that has, if, if this is still five inches for the, I mean, for the whole, the whole slab, the, when you work out the n neutral axis, it comes, it comes higher. It'll go into the slab. So I played around with these numbers a little bit earlier. Let me see if I can find where it was. One point, one point something or other. So that... The neutral axis is actually, well, it's kind of like this. Okay, a little bit higher maybe even. Um, at any rate, when you go to calculate the, let me see, I'll oh, put this number on here. This was uh, for the neutral axis. Um, the number I got was actually quite a bit lower, one point. Oh, that can't be right. Or is that from the bottom? Oop, no, now it looks like three. Oh, I had three. Oh, well. Maybe I better not put it up there because I got my, mum, my number. I'd have to work through it, and I don't want to go all the way through it. But, but uh, the point is, you don't, you don't, uh, <coughs> you don't count this in the, in the equation. And when you do the, the part on the next page, uh, oops, the part on this, This part here, the neutral axis would not be down there below, but actually right at that. So that, that first equation, in the book, he'll use uh, a, different, a different formula, the BD cubed over 3. That's just for, that's the moment of inertia for this rectangle, not about the center, but about this baseline. So when you do that, you don't need any of the other that <coughs> um, AD squared term is 0. And then the other part is, remains the same, this uh, I for the steel. And then you do get an AD squared term over here, <coughs> which you'd add up. But this this number, that, that confuses some people. I, I don't have quite time to do, do it with numbers because I think I may have a mistake anyway in that. But <clears throat> the point is you have to be careful when that, when that goes up into the, into the concrete. Disregard the, the area of the concrete below it and then, and then use this, this equation for the concrete part. There's no, there's no AD squared component and then put in the same 
the same uh, treatment for the steel as what you had before, except the numbers change for D, of course, but I is the same. And then you can, and then you get a different moment of inertia. All right, so 